Hi, everybody. I'm Lizzie, and I'm a member of the CPR Institute's Young Leaders and Alternative Dispute Resolution Steering Committee. I am delighted to host today's episode of the CPR Wire ADR Corporate Council Interview Series. For those who don't know, the YADR seeks to educate the next generation of leaders in the ADR field about the full spectrum of dispute prevention and resolution mechanisms, and to provide an insider's view into how CPR's community of external counsel, internal counsel, experts and neutrals are using this full range of dispute resolution and prevention mechanisms to resolve disputes to enable purpose. And as part of this goal, I started this interview series speaking to corporate counsel and companies all around the world about their experiences with alternative dispute resolution, as well as their advice for young practitioners. Today, I am delighted to welcome Vivek Gambier, who is the general counsel corporate of the Abu Dhabi National Energy Company based in Abu Dhabi. Hi Vivek, we're delighted to have you. Thank you very much. Good to be here, Elizabeth. My first question for you is, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your career experience? Um, I started my career as a litigator uh, in India, where I spent uh, quite a few years um, before I moved on to uh, work for an international law firm, uh, focusing on the, the power sector. And I had a, a rich experience of working in a variety of uh, transactions, different areas of the power sector, um, internationally in many, many jurisdictions. And um, over the last 10 years, I have been now with Abu Dhabi National Energy Company as general counsel and um, have gained um, enormous insight into how uh, the businesses work, what are the pinch points for the businesses when it comes to legal matters and looking at it from the lens of the business rather than from a private practice point of view of advising a client. Um, so that, that has been a, a very interesting period as well, which has allowed me to get quite a comprehensive view of uh, the issues that concern uh, businesses more generally and specifically in the energy sector. Hmm. And could you tell us a little more about the company that you work for, uh, your role and your involvement in disputes? Um, my company is a um, power and oil and gas company. Uh, we have we are a vertically integrated utility in the United Arab Emirates, where we are um, into generation of power, transmission and distribution of power in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. And we have international power assets as well as oil and gas upstream and midstream assets um, in over 11 jurisdictions. Uh, I um, look after uh, the corporate and corporate affairs currently, which uh, involves, amongst other things, um, looking at corporate restructurings, and, uh, financings, disputes, amongst others. Um, my involvement with disputes um, is quite hands-on. Um, I am quite uh, deeply involved in matters related in disputes concerning some of our operating companies, and I'm actively managing those disputes uh, from inception uh, to the end. Um, speaking about the life cycle of a dispute, if we start, or, or even the pre-dispute process, I wanted to talk a little bit about the dispute resolution clause. I was wondering uh, if there are any particular factors that you consider when you're negotiating a dispute resolution clause. Yeah, we, we do. Um, we, we pay a fair bit of attention to dispute resolution clauses. First and foremost, we need to decide whether the dispute resolution clause needs to be a court or an arbitration. There are factors which come into play in making that decision. For example, if the parties are local UAE parties, we tend to go for UAE courts. Uh, if there is an international element involved, then we need to decide whether it's going to be the courts in UAE or whether it's going to be the courts in, in overseas uh, 
jurisdictions uh, and we tend to choose uh, England over others just because of our familiarity and comfort with the English law. Um, for complex matters, we would again consider whether arbitration and whether it should be sole arbitration or three member arbitration, which is, which is important where that arbitration should be. So these are matters which we pay a fair bit of close attention to when deciding what should be the governing law of the matter, as well as the governing law for the dispute resolution, and also with the mechanism by which the dispute must be resolved. When it comes to a choice of arbitration, I was wondering if you have a preference as to seat and institution. Again, this is something we, uh, we tend to uh, pay a fair bit of attention to. I think the, the rules are something we try to agree with the counterparty, whatever they are comfortable with. There are typically we would either go for LCIA, ICC or SEAC rules, um, which we are more familiar with. Uh, it also depends to some extent on the place of uh, the seat of arbitration, for example, uh, over here in the UAE, we would go for ICC because they are established here uh, and we have um, proximity to the, to the ICC here. Um, but again, it's, it's a question of the familiarity you get with the rules, having been exposed to arbitrations governed under those rules. Uh, and also there are changes which are continuously taking place more recently. There have been a lot of changes in the rules in the ICC and NCIA. There may be some changes which may come in the future with SEAC. So you have to continuously evaluate which is a better choice. Uh, the seat is very important. Um, we like to insist on neutrality of the seat, um, particularly, uh, and I think it's, it's beneficial and healthy for both parties to have a neutral seat so that you are not, even if it is not real, but at least not giving a perception of being a partial sort of dispute resolution mechanism. So yes, uh, we do take those factors into consideration when deciding the seat. And I, I also wanted to raise one point, uh, which is important to the CPI Institute. So as I mentioned before, one of our purposes is to manage conflict to enable purpose. And we think that, you know, businesses' purpose is to get on with their business um, and they're not in the business of disputes. So one of the focuses of the CPR's work is on dispute prevention and conflict avoidance. And I was wondering if uh, in, your, in your experience, there are particular strategies for avoiding disputes and conflict. Um, yes, there are. And I think uh, as an in-house royal lawyer, um, you don't serve the organization well if you are, if your approach is, well, you always can raise a dispute, make it difficult for the other party, and we'll see what happens. I think the, and it's not always helpful to take a very conservative approach as well um, in relation to disputes. Uh, I think the, the approach at least I like to take is to objectively assess and evaluate the issue at hand. Uh, objectively assess what are our weak points and what are our strengths. And if the weak points are, um, uh, are, are, are more than the strengths, then objectively decide, um, work with the commercial teams to work to find a solution which would mitigate or minimize the risk that you may have should you go for disputes. Um, of course, one can only um, settle if the other side is being reasonable and is also taking an, a similar approach. Uh, if they don't, then it, uh, you are sometimes forced to go into disputes and equally when they are not being reasonable and you have a justified claim, you are forced to go into that. But what I would say is that one needs to um, take an objective view, uh, share that objective view, um, if necessary, get it validated by an external counsel and, and then work with the commercial teams to, to develop a strategy as to how you wish to um, pursue that, whether avoidance is better than fighting the dispute. 
as you say, sometimes it's not possible to avoid a dispute and you are dragged into international arbitration. So you mentioned already at the beginning of this interview that you're very actively involved in the management of a dispute, including from its inception. I was wondering if you wanted to say a little more about the, your role as in-house counsel throughout the life cycle of a dispute. Sure. Um, I have found that, um, I'm as I said, I'm actively engaged in disputes. And the reason for that is that I think that it is important for the in-house councils to contribute to a number of things in relation to the dispute um, when, when engaging, having engaged external counsel. The external counsel will come at this very cold. They will not have backgrounds in relation to why certain things are written in a certain fashion, why certain commercial terms have been addressed in a certain way. Um, so therefore, it is important to take uh, a lot of care in, in making them understand what really the transaction is about, what really the dispute is about, and um, not just be a post box to provide materials to them and look at what they've done. One needs, uh, so what I tend to do is I engage with the, with the councils um, from the very outset I, I actively involve myself in developing the strategy for the dispute. Um, I also uh, closely review the materials that are prepared uh, in relation to the pleadings that are prepared for the disputes, uh, in relation to the selecting the witnesses who would be relevant for those disputes to the extent required, and help even go to the extent of working with the, uh, with the councils to, uh, to prepare for a cross-examination should there be uh, oral evidence uh, required in that. And I think this, what, what I'm trying to effectively say is that you need to become part of the team of the external council and bring your in-house perspective, which, you sh which one should not take very lightly. I mean, not very, I mean what I mean is it is, not, it is not an insignificant contribution. It's a significant contribution that an in-house counsel can bring and that can play a major part in the success or failure of the dispute. I, I love that idea of working as a team with external counsel, you know, that in-house in counsel aren't just acting as a post box, as you say, but they're really integrated into, you know, working together with external counsel and developing the best strategy for the client. I, I think that's, that's really great because, you know, at, at particular junctures in the arbitration, you might want to change that strategy and always keeping in touch with the client means that, you know, at every step you're making decisions that best align with the client's commercial objectives. That's true. And, and in fact, uh, it's been quite rewarding in the sense that I've, um, it's not, it, it's something which has um, materially impacted uh, and and anybody who's who's in my position, I'm sure, will will feel the same way. Mm. And speaking of working with external counsel, what do you appreciate most about effective external counsel that you've worked with? So a couple of um, uh, factors. Uh, obviously, knowledge of law is is a given. And um, but what is more important, I think, uh, which can which would be of help to uh, to clients would be an objective assessment of the of the case the pros as to where what are our strengths what are our weaknesses help develop a strategy for dispute um, uh, management and dispute um, resolution in the sense that what are the best what is the best way to present your position what are the things to be focused on and with the object, with the, with the ultimate objective of trying to obviously mitigate the consequences, but having absorbed fully what uh, what the factual and contextual position is in relation to the matter at hand, and then the the soft uh, uh, sort of skills of uh, of an effective counsel 
who have done who has done a number of arbitrations as to what works, what doesn't work, what are the expectations of the arbitration tribunal, second guessing what the other side is trying to, is going to focus on, and then preparing yourself for it. I think those contributions from an effective counsel go a great length to uh, help in determining what you want to contribute as well to that process because you then get an assessment what is important what is not and you think in your mind okay these are the facts which i need to point out these are the facts which i need to check these are the facts we need to get from the other side and therefore it, it helps a great deal in preparing for the entire uh, case that is to be presented and or defended as the case may be I'll certainly re remember that that very good advice in my own work as international as external counsel as well. You know, as a practitioner of international arbitration, I'm obviously a, a big advocate of it. I was wondering if you could comment on what works a little less well in international arbitration. Well, there is, the, frankly, there is an international arbitration is such a, um, especially if you're doing it at recognized institutions, and with recognized law firms and uh, uh, and the support staff, I think it's 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 quite a well established process, and it's quite efficient, generally speaking. Um, the one uh, one or two things that I have uh, in my limited experience of handling international arbitrations is that. Um, where there are disputes which are sort of industry specific, I think it is important that the arbitrators be selected um, on the basis of, um, or have, uh, we should select arbitrators who have some background about that industry or have, have the experience of either having worked in the industry or have uh, dealt with matters relating to that industry at length and understand why, who are then able to understand clearly why, for example, the contracts are structured in a certain way, why certain commercial terms are done in a certain way. There are certain unwritten um, commercial contexts uh, in a contract, the background of the industry, the background of the sector, the background of the regulation, which all informs the way the contracts are structured. And what that does is it sort of has um, obviously material advantages in my personal view, namely you get to the nub of the problem quicker. Uh, you are able to fully appreciate the issues and ask the relevant questions. And then you are able to um, sort of uh, commercially align an equitable position on that dispute. Um, and that, um, is, is something which can uh, provide confidence to the parties that the dispute has been resolved in the context of the business that they are in, rather than importing principles of some other business that people are sort of more familiar with than the dispute at hand. So um, I, 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 it's, not, it's not a shortcoming of international arbitrations. I think it's just an observation on what um, uh, sort of consideration could be applied in addition to what we normally do in international arbitrations. Mm -hmm. In this last part of the interview, I wanted to pivot um, to the topic of advice for young practitioners. So what advice do you have for the next generation of young leaders in alternative dispute resolution? I personally think you couldn't be in a better place and a point in time if you want to take up ADR. ADR today is mainstream dispute resolution. It's no more an alternate to my mind. Um, it used to be called alternate dispute resolution because everybody used to go to the court. But today, the number of disputes that go to arbitrations is astronomical compared to what it was 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago. There are so many institutions which have come up and are regularly coming up, which are very well reputed. There are so many uh, individuals who are well recognized arbitrators, practitioners in arbitration. There are established practices that have come in, established principles that have been established. 
So, and there have been, there are regular improvements. So anybody who wishes to go into ADR, um, a, it, it's, it's something which you should seriously consider uh, as a profession, because I think there is a lot that will happen in due course. Um, this is a, there are markets which are yet to take off in terms of dispute, on, in terms of dispute resolution through arbitrations. And um, there is a lot, there's a lot of opportunity to do so. Um, so you just need to, to plan as to how to get the right, equip yourself with the right tools to be able to, uh, to practice that. I completely agree with you, Vivek, that there is no better time to practice alternative dispute resolution. Well, it remains for me to thank you for your time and your insights and to thank our audience for tuning in.